Hello everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. A very warm welcome to Meet Menaka, celebrating you. We are at our episode 128 today. We are going to delve into the invisible chains, exploring the crippling effect of shame with psychotherapist and psychologist Arani Balasingham today. Thank you so much for all of you for joining us here and on Facebook and supporting us all this time. Our mission is to touch and inspire 1 million hearts and lives, fostering health, happiness, and hope in every participant. You can join our vibrant 90-minute multicultural online talk show designed to celebrate each and every one of you and create a positive social change, whether you're seeking personal growth, professional development, or simply a community of like-minded individuals. Meet America platform offers meaningful connection and transformative experiences for everyone, including ourselves. So mark your calendar for the first Sunday of every month at two o'clock UK time and join us on Zoom where you can interact with other participants and ask questions directly to the speakers. If you cannot for any reason, we do have library of our past episodes on the YouTube channel Meet Menaka. Can I request you for you to support us to grow and be able to get better speakers, better quality speakers by subscribing to the channel and supporting us to grow together. Let's come back why we are talking about this today and what are we going to gain. Arani and myself have had lots of conversations regarding this and with other friends. And I think many things what we do and we don't do stem from the place of shame, or at least we perceive it to be. So it will be interesting discussion, I think, and hopefully we will all learn something when we finish this call. Arani brings over 15 years of invaluable experience in counseling, psychology, and psychosocial interventions, specializing in survivors of sexual gender-based violence, child abuse, and war trauma. A dedication to BAME, BIM, mental health, women empowerment, and trauma advocacy reflects a commitment to social justice and human rights. Hopefully, you will gain profound insights, actionable strategies, and a renewed sense of hope after this call. Before we dive deep, a very warm welcome to all of you, and thank you so much, Arne for being on the show. Thank you, Menaka. I'm so glad to be here. Finally, we've been talking about this for quite some time. So I'm really, really, you know, glad and happy to be here. Thank you. So I first want to ask, it is a very, it could sound like a complex uh, subject when you see superficially, or it might sound very simplistic. So why this topic? Why are you keen on talking about this topic, about invisible chains, particularly the crippling effects of shame? Sure, sure. So as you said, it is, uh, obviously it sounds like a simple thing. Shame is a word that we've obviously heard, we've learned, whatever. But when we apply it to life, it's not something that we actually experience or allow ourselves to experience. It's hidden. It's it's pretty much invisible, but it's everywhere where it's deeply rooted. It's complex. It's rarely spoken about. It's a taboo when it comes to deep down sort of, you know, chronic shame, let's say. Uh, we all experience it on a daily basis in some form or manner. For example, you know, if I said, if I mispronounced a word at that moment, I'm probably going to be like, ooh, you know, feel a quick sort of feeling of shame, but it's not going to break me emotionally or or break, you know, my core sense of self. But let's say if it was something else that was part of my identity or a, a particular behavior against, you know, societal norms, um, or maybe I've, I don't know, I've just not sort of been successful as a society wants to, you know, uh, see me successful, then of course, there's a lot of more chronic shame attached to it, which is 
very, very damaging, very crippling and very paralyzing. So which is why I think it's very important for us to start talking a little bit about it, like create a safe space and also a culture for us to actually start talking about this without feeling shame to talk about shame. Yeah, I I agree. I think, um, you know, I have felt shame many times. Uh, I have decided to do things or not to do things because of that. And it's, it is always a journey you know, you take, it's it doesn't happen in one day or two days. So yeah. do you think when we talk about uh, with our older generation or even like our kids might look at us and say the same, our generation, do you think shame is a modern concept or have we become more sensitive to, sensitive to it now mm-hmm. or has it always been there and we just didn't talk about it? I don't think it's a modern concept. I think it has been there for, I don't know, since the beginning of, you know, mankind, since the beginning of societies were formed, etc. But I think it's being understood very differently now. People, there's a lot of focus around it because of studies in sociology, psychology, anthropology, um, in education, you know, especially when we're looking at students' attainment, you know, we're wondering why is it that certain students are unable to, um, again, you know, around um, even even medical stuff, for example, like if we took COVID vaccinations, for example, how many of us felt shamed into having it or how many of us couldn't say no to it or felt you know there was there was there was like this disparity right the majority and the minority and the minorities were kind of ostracized from the majority for not following certain patterns and rules and expectations so i think it's it's there but it's just that we don't really talk about it it's in the academic field it's coming across in therapeutic work within therapy rooms, for example. But I think today the topic is more about prevention. It's more about opening ourselves to the topic itself and to the experience of shame and what it looks like, because it's a universal experience. Um, you know, it doesn't differ across cultures. It doesn't, it's it's not specific to a particular gender or particular age group. It's literally everywhere. The other thing is that it's closely associated or it's known as different terminologies in different um, societies. So for example, we may, you know, we may sort of like gently call it as humiliation or embarrassment or, you know, disrespect, or sometimes we may even say like, it's honor. It's like, you know, we've, we've, you know, lost our honor or the family's honor or our culture's honor or something like that. Um, So it's, it's important to understand that It's not a new thing, but it's been there for ages, but we're just focusing on it in a different way now. Uh, Thanks, Ali. I think it's very, very important for us to understand because every generation, our previous generation, our generation, perhaps the generation to come will do the same. We Mm. always say this generation is not talking talking about it, but we all went through, we were okay, right? It perhaps wasn't okay. It's just that might be uh, we are having spaces like this to talk about it more more openly Mm. now, which perhaps we didn't have initially. Exactly, exactly. Can you tell us how we shame developed? Is it something we are born with or do we pick this up on our way when we grow up? It's interesting, isn't it? Because shame is a complex emotion. And it's just like, say, for example, anger or joy or, you know, something like that, which is kind of like innate human responses. But with shame, it's something that does not develop in isolation. So what I mean is, you know, you're just not born with an emotion of shame, you actually experience it in relation to the other. So it starts from childhood, from, you know, early childhood, from a a baby learns about it. Once they become a toddler, once they're told not to do something, don't touch, you know, that's wrong or a quick tap. And they're like immediately feeling a bit of like, oh, why am I having to now, you know, be a certain way? Or when we actually tell them how to socialize in certain situations, we kind of, you know, we start, start sort of like telling them these are the right behaviors, these are wrong behaviors. So when we say wrong behaviors, again, there's like an element of shame attached to it as well. And again, it moves on into cultural and social norms. So we say, this is our culture. This is how we have to dress. We have to speak, you know, we have to behave. We have to obey our parents, um, you know, respect our elders, uh, follow a particular religion, for example. And it all kind of comes with sort of with this umbrella terminology of if you didn't, then 
there's an element of shame, you know. And again, it could also differ parenting styles, what languages we, we use, what kind of punishments do we use? You know, like we were, you know, in my time, it was like we were like slapped or whatever, you know, like the wooden spoon comes out <laughs> and misbehave. Uh, but nowadays it's more about, you know, a naughty chair or a naughty corner or something. And there is still something up there where we shame a person's behavior and we kind of teach them this is wrong. Right. And they start learning. There is a concept of shame. So this is what shame looks like. This is what it feels. And they stop misbehaving because if not, you're going to experience that, you know, experience of shame, which is not very pleasant at all. So that's how it develops. And then, of course, it goes on and gets instilled in many ways. Uh, thanks, Ari. So, you know, shame, we have established and we have perhaps known for a long time. It is a primary emotion. We are going to all feel yeah. it. So now listening to you, uh, people might be thinking, is it a bad emotion then? Because, you know, it is right. always bad to... Right. Uh, so it's not necessarily bad, right? So the whole concept of shame kind of developed earlier on with societies needing to coexist, needed to function socially. Um, there needed to be cooperation, um, you know, ethics, for example, um, certain laws, for example. So it wasn't necessarily bad. Obviously, when it all came together, when people come together, there is a groupism, there is a, a, a sense of belonging. So in, in order for you to belong, you needed to abide by certain social rules. If you didn't, then you get ostracized, you get isolated, right? You get left behind. So because of that, a lot of people actually started conforming, started behaving, you know, within those certain rules. But it becomes a, a problem when it actually cripples someone or when it paralyzes someone, when it numbs someone, uh, someone's sense of self-worth, someone's sense of identity, someone's um, sort of, you know, behavior, thought process, self-esteem, for example, you know, things like that could result in very, very harming effect. And I think lately that's where we're headed because there is a lot, again, with globalization, with social media, with internet, et cetera, there is a lot of these things that happens that actually makes people feel the shame more chronically to a point of not being able to live a, a real authentic life by embracing themselves to who they are. Yeah, Arne, so we, are, we have all witnessed, right, the effect of shame and the mental health the, and the link to it. We have experienced ourselves. We have seen other people experience it. Um, I know you. As a psychologist and a psychotherapist, I'm sure you have come across mm -hmm. um, these uh, people who have uh, gone through this much more than intensively than uh, perhaps I do. So what is the effect of shame on mental health, would you say? Oh, several. It's multifaceted. It's multilayered. It starts off perhaps with low self-esteem to begin with, with in children, in teenagers, you know, persistently when they start feeling shame, it's like they just feel like I'm not worthy. It starts off with I'm not clever. I'm not good enough. I'm not pretty enough. Um, you know, I don't have a lot of friends. I'm not very popular, et cetera. So there's quite a lot around low self-esteem and you start believing those things. It becomes your core sense of self. You're almost your inner voice to say, ah, oh, see, you're not likable and therefore you don't have any friends, right? So lots of shame and that sort of makes you go within your own sort of shell again. You're not going to come out of it. And if it progresses a little bit more, then there's, of course, depression, right? So again, linking to feelings of hopelessness, not achieving the grades you wanted to get or the jobs you wanted to get into, the universities you wanted to get into, the sense of failure again, you know, I'm not good enough. And it's all sort of driven by this element of, of shame and, and how people, you know, really struggle to overcome these things uh, on their own is even more harder. So even when I say depression, for example, the term itself, and there's another layer of, you know, shame around the stigma around mental health and the terminology of depression and, you know, things like that. So like I said, it's multifaceted and multilayered. But again, anxiety is another one. It's also driven by, you know, there's a lot of uh, shame attached to it as well, where people feel worried about being rejected, not fitting in, being judged. It could be for various things. It could be appearances. It could be, you know, qualities, or it could be vocabulary, language, 
Um, it could be ethnicity, because we see that within different minority groups, you know, saying, oh, I don't know where I fit in. Uh, we see this a lot in, in, in bicultural, multicultural children, uh, migrant families, for example. You know, there's, there's quite a lot of that that we actually see around anxiety as well. Then all of these things leads to social isolation. All right. So you don't fit in. You don't fit into the majority of the group. You become the isolated, um, you know, outlier, so to speak. So social isolation, you don't want to go out because you find it very difficult. No one's going to like me. No one's talking to me. I feel like I'm not worthy. All right. So again, social withdrawal. That again leads to substance abuse. Sometimes because you have to cope. How do you cope? with that pain because it's, it's quite painful because though we're talking about it very casually each of these things are extremely painful so for example with substance abuse you know let's say if we were to take a male sort of individual who has successfully i don't know had a business let's say and suddenly they lost it all you know, can you imagine the amount of shame that they go through in the society if they were a son, a brother or a father, you know, their roles, again, the social roles that they have to play and they're unable to do those things. And how do you cope with it? You can't talk about shame or how it makes you feel. So, of course, having to face these adversities is really, really hard. So you end up sort of going, you know, withdrawing into substance misuse in some way to cope with the pain. Okay. And it also, some other things that leads to is around relationship difficulties. So let's say if you have, and you're, you're smiling, so we've all been there, we all know this, right? So when we have low self-esteem, when we don't have a strong sense of self, we end up sort of having to wear masks around people, having to pretend we can't be authentic, we can't be ourselves. So there's a lot of, of, of things where we're not really you know, uh, allowing ourselves to be ourselves in certain relationships because we have to look a certain way, we have to behave a certain way. Um, if there is, let's say, I don't know, sexual relationships, especially with, or around Asian, South Asian women, then there's, of course, another layer of shame attached to it as well, right? There's a question of purity. There is a question of like, what does this look like for you then if that relationship didn't work out? Um, and, and while I'm saying this, I'm just, you know, sort of remembering some conversations I had with, the, you know, a few friends where they think that if you're not married, you know, you failed. Oh, you were dating, but you're not married. So, you know, it's a failure. Or you've been having a, a living relationship with someone or you've been dating someone. And again, around, you know, a female not being able to marry that person or, or be successful in life brings a lot of shame. How do they face it? How do they deal with this, right? It's it's very isolating. It's very painful. So it's not just about the shame itself, what you feel. It's the effects of it afterwards. How do you then address it? Who do you go to? What happens? When you have no one, you end up, you know, self-harming, suicidal, sadly, suicidal, um, you know, um, thoughts and attempts. And some have actually even sadly, you know, ended their lives as well because it's really, really painful and 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 it's lonely and scary to, you know, live alone with, with all that shame, all that judgments, all that discrimination. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Ali. I can relate to it, as you know. Um, you know, social construct and the social norm, right? You mm -hmm. are the outlier. Uh, yeah. You become the outlier in your family. You become the outlier in your community. You become the outlier everywhere. And, uh, you know, uh, people even say to that extent, oh, you know, uh, this is someone who shared the story. So, you know, please don't do it. It's yeah. not a good, it's not going to end up well. So, right, it, 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 right? we have had this conversation. And so uh, I can tell for myself personally, because I didn't study in English till, you know, when I went to university, I am always conscious how I pronounce words, like you said, mm. spot on. You know, am I pronouncing it right? Is you know, it, it, because I'm going to be charged if I don't, right? Particularly in a professional way. Uh, you know, like I, I have spoken about this many times when I was a child. My mom is much more lighter skinned, just thin, tall. And people have told me directly on my face after coming to the UK, well, with every generation, it's going downhill, mm. right? And uh, correct, right? So, and then on top of it, to put the crown on the thing, I then I got divorced. Then I declared I, I did have depression. So you did, then definitely become the symbol of failure in many people's eyes. 
then it is, I think it's a lot of work. And I, I think in some, some ways or the other, personally for me, um, I was blessed to have that support with my friends and you know, sometimes family, sometimes not. But, you know, at, at, and I have that capacity. Not everybody has. And we have seen some devastating effects very recently as well, even with teenagers, young adults committing suicide, like you said, uh, being bullied into it, being sexually harassed into it. Because sometimes we victimize the victim mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that help them. What do you think of it? Oh, absolutely. It is It is so ingrained that it is, we're not even aware of what we're doing. You know, there's a lot of othering that happens that we're not even aware of it. So for example, even, even for myself, I was ashamed of something that happened a couple of years ago, where as part of this, um, a seminar around refugees. And I thought, oh, this is something I'm passionate about, right? So... I, I've worked with a lot of refugees and I'm familiar with it and I need to sort of, you know, tell the others, the non, non Sri Lankans, let's say, or Sri Lankan Tamils about the experience of it. And interestingly, I was like, you know, talking very passionately about it. And then at one point I kind of said, oh, just to clarify, I, I'm not a refugee myself, but just to, just to let you know, oh, I'm not I'm not a refugee, but this is their experience. And on the spot, I just immediately sort of reflected going, hang on a minute, why did I feel the need to say that? What was it? What made me to say that? And I reflected about it on the spot with, with my participants, with the people there. And I said, there's something here going on. That is shame. I was, there was this stigma around refugees and there was something in me that did not allow me to sort of be known as a refugee. And I felt that, you know, didn't change anything. I'm still a Sri Lankan Tamil. I've still gone through the experiences of war and, you know, all the other victimization and marginalization and what if it's not, none of that is going to change. But what was it? So there's something about these labels that we give different people, the judgments attached to it, the prejudices attached to it, right? And the biases. And it's so invisible and it's so ingrained. It's very subtle in what we say, how we say it, the language we speak, or even silences. So again, like, you know, within families, like families could be like, oh, we don't, we don't really, you know, we don't talk about it. Like we're good. Yes, you are. But what are you, what are you saying? It's shameful to talk about it. Right? You're saying it's shameful. Let's not talk about it. Silence is also actually sort of translate as shame to the next generations. And we're teaching a very sort of fear mongering shame culture where certain things are just not allowed when, or we don't talk about it. The difference- It's not in only silence, Arani. You force other people, you kind of like to be silenced, right? Oh, true, yeah. Yeah, because there's fear, right? What happens? Okay, let's, let's actually, they don't do this on purpose. They actually do it to protect. Right. So if we were to say what happens if we were vocal, what happens? You and I know if we're vocal about something, you yes. get ostracized, you get judged. Right. So a lot of people fear for us and they do try to protect. And not just us, of course, when we tell our children as well, it's like, oh, let's not talk about it. Let's keep it hidden. Let's let's not, you know, let's it's it's not something we would tell because we're afraid that they would not be part of this community or that they would not belong. They would be judged. Then again, you know, we would be judged as, as a result of it as well. So there's a lot of layers to it. And it's not easy to break these. You know, it's not it's not like, you know, suddenly we have this talk and everyone's like, OK, from tomorrow onwards, like, you know, we're not going to we're not going to feel shame or we're going to break it. It's, it's, it's not that easy at all because it's so ingrained in who we are. And we will feel it on a daily, daily, daily basis in, in every single thing that we do. Right. So I think it's it's good that we're able to have these sort of platforms and people interested to talk about this and also learn a bit about this because we just don't realize how severe it is. Because if I said depression, of course, it's it's on the DSM. Right. It's on the manual. There's medications for it. It's medicalized. If I said, you know, PTSD, yes, it's the same thing. But with shame is attached to all of these things. But we just don't talk about it. So do you think, Arnie, like it affects in mostly or in children, teenagers or adults or young adults, or it just affects across the board? To I think I think it affects every single person in different ways. 
right? It's harder when you're a child or when you're a teenager because you want to belong, you're learning to make friends, you're learning, you know, social interactions, relationships, building relationships, and, and you're innocent, you know, you're, you're, you're trusting people, you're getting to know people. So it, it obviously affects them very differently. But let's say, you know, people who are in their middle ages and whatever, they've seen a fair bit of it. So they may experience it very differently, but it doesn't mean that they don't. Different genders experience it differently. Like, you know, how we tell a, a boy that she's not allowed to cry. A man is not allowed to show emotions. You know, be a man, be a macho man. Like, if you're not, you know, you don't fit in. Those sort of things, right? And again, with a woman, it's like, what does it mean to be a woman? You've got to be motherly. So what if you did not have motherly feelings? What does that mean then? You know, are you not good enough? And who has defined it, right? What is motherly feeling or what is to be a man? You know, we are, as a social concept, we are defining how other people have to think, feel and behave. Exactly, exactly. But it's across every, every, every aspect of life. And if we were to talk about age, for example, after a certain age, ageism, it's not something we talk about in our Asian cultures, right? It's like, oh, you're a grandparent now, you know, it's a, you're retired. What does that mean? Or well, what sort of shame? Can you imagine the shame that people go through after being in a top job and, you know, having a state as a title, um, some sort of career, and now they're, you know, they're just retired. And what does that look like then, right? So their purpose and, and how they're perceived gets, you know, it's, there's, there's a lot of shame, uh, shame attached to that as well. Age is one. Sex is one. Again, you know, around different genders as well. There's a lot attached to everything in all parts of life, but in different ways, absolutely different ways. And again, work. You know, we, we don't, it's just not school, it's professional uh, places as well. You know, do you own a house? Do you have a car? What happens if you don't, right? So again, it's it's everything. What clothes do you wear? You know, how... how Which school did you go to? Right, which school did you go to? Was it grammar or was it like Asian <laughs> families? We all know we want our kids to go to grammar school and not just state school. Why is that? What happens if our kids went to state school? So what are we instilling in these kids? The language, what are we saying? You're not worthy if you don't do this, right? You're not worthy, you're not good enough. And we're creating this competition, this constant competition to be better, to be better, but to be better. Better in what way? What happens if you aren't, right? So it's almost like we are, we're sort of instilling it in such a subtle way. We don't use the word shame, but we shame them. You know, and it's it's these conditions of worth, that sense of self, what does good enough look like for each person to not feel shame? So it's a, it's, a, it's a very difficult one. It's a nuanced topic. It's not something, even with researchers, they're finding it difficult because they're like, they, you can't pinpoint and catch it, right? I mean, obviously when, when people come to us for, you know, clinical work and, and stuff like that, it's present in our work. Shame is very present in our work and we tend to work with it, but... I think the conversations we're having today is to try and prevent some of this or create some awareness around this so we don't get to that stage. True, Arnie, because I'm not, I'm far from perfect. I am one of those moms who really wanted my daughter to go to, uh, you know, do the 11 plus and go to the grammar school. But I think there are many shades and forms in it and the range of, you know, how much it's important, I guess, for each person. We all feel ashamed and uh, you know, fight for different things, I guess. But this, I think what is important to, uh, about today's talk is at least then we are aware it could have this effect on somebody. Yes. So it's creating mindfulness. You know, it's creating people to um, sort of like check in with themselves. So if we were to look at, you know, how can we address some of these things? There's two ways. So there's self, which is which is us. So we're checking in. It's about us. And there's the society that we live in, which is also, you know, obviously sort of growing the culture of shame, so to speak. So when, when we talk about self, it's about, you know, recognizing and acknowledging this is happening. We don't, we don't, we, we just go with life, we flow with life, you know, we're so busy doing everything else, we're always looking at, you know, how much, you know, money we've got, or the holidays we've been on, or, you know, the amount of friends we have on social media, the cars we buy, the houses, and, you know, it's, it's, there's a lot of these things that goes on. Great, of course, that's life, and that's brilliant. But at least if we could just stop and just check in with ourselves, what is it that we're unfailing here? You know, what what behaviors am I actually exhibiting here because of shame? 
Am I having to change certain things? If when I go to a place, am I able to be myself? Or do I need to play a part because I feel a bit ashamed to show my true colors, right? What does that mean then? The attires we wear, do we choose them based on, you know, certain, certain um, I don't know, social events or places we go to? We're like, oh, it's a bit shameful for me to wear a sari and go to this, for example, let's say, right? We so were talking about it, right, Tani, the other day. Like, um, I love wearing sari. I love wearing a power dress. I'm happy to wear both or the two desire. I, I, I love dressing, getting dressed up, so it's not a problem. But sometimes you're forced to wear certain things or you feel pressured to be fair, wear a sari or the other way around because you are going to be the outlier if you don't. Don't. Right. So that's that's the main thing, isn't it? You become the outlier. And that is something that we don't like to do. We want to fit in. We want to be part of something. We don't want to be the outlier because it's really scary to be alone there. You know, it's it's like you're going to be judged. You're going to be different, right? You're going to have to face whatever people throw at you and almost defend yourself to some extent. So which is one of the reasons why we want to kind of, you know, fit in. So always checking in, is this shame? What I feel, is this shame? Let's familiarize that feeling. A lot of us won't even feel it. You know, it's it's one, it's a very interesting thing. A lot of people feel numb because it's denial. Shame is so painful. So you just don't allow yourself to feel it at all. So it's knowing, it's recognizing, it's becoming aware. Only you know, right? Somebody else cannot come and tell you, oh, you're feeling shame there. And it's it's... It's not, it's not how it works. Like anger is very expressive, you can, but this is hidden. It's completely hidden, right? Okay. And again, noticing the um, triggers. So identifying your triggers. Is it is it people? Is it a context? Is it an environment that's triggering these things? Like what is it? What triggers this shame, right? Just noticing these things. It doesn't mean you have like, we don't have ready-made answers for every single person, like I said, because this is part of your whole life, right? Like how do you know? But checking in, noticing the triggers, challenging some of the negative thought that comes to you. A lot of us don't do certain things because of fear of failure. Failure then sort of like translates to shame, right? You're not good enough. So challenging those negative thoughts. If, if you're about to do something, what's the worst thing you could do? Let's normalize, you know, some of the uh, failures a little bit. Let's challenge some of those negative thoughts and not attach shame to every single step of failure. Because that's huge. A lot of people, and again, you know, they find it like a few failures in their life. Their life's gone. But what is life without failure? Life is full of failure. Life is all about failure. Till the day we die, we're going to be failing and learning and failing and learning. And that's how it is. There's no manual. So let's just normalize some of these things rather than attaching shame. But it's not easy. It's just not easy. You know, especially when you're trying to change your own thoughts, it's more scary to challenge your own self is quite scary because we have been brought up in a certain way. We've, you know, been raised in a certain way. We belong within a community, within, you know, different, let's say, groups as well, whether it's at work or university or within family settings or relatives or friends, circle, etc. So it's very difficult for us to now break free from it and sort of be different, think different talk differently but um, we have to we have to. thanks Ari I think I agree with you like being driven having a wanting a nice car wanting a nice house or going for holidays or having a good profession it's all good provided you want it for the right reason because you you that makes you happy not because it is to prove a point we have all done things to prove a point, you know, many times. Yeah, at least I have done. I can put up my hands and say, Same. you know, right? Same. Yeah. So I think that's the subtle difference because we don't, sub I, I think what you said is to stop and think about it. That gives us the space to think at least why we are chasing something. Yes. Or not chasing something. Oh, exactly. Or not. Exactly. And be okay with being different. And I think that's where the biggest thing is. And it's a scary thing because we don't want to be different. We want to fit in, right? So how do you accept yourself fully with all parts of, you know, yourselves knowing you're not perfect, you know, you're, you're completely flawed and being okay with it, not feeling shamed and you make a mistake. Yes, we all do. But then how do you then deal with it? 
being compassionate towards yourself, right? Creating a self-compassion. What would you tell a friend, for example, if a friend came and said to you, oh, you know, I completely messed up in this. You're going to show them a lot of compassion and be like, oh, it's okay. Don't worry about it. You could try later. But when it's when it comes to you, that inner critical voice, that, that voice with shame and, you know, like blame and all sorts of stuff comes in going, oh, look, this is it. You're not going to get this job because you're not worthy. You know, you're, you're, failing because you're not worthy. It's a lot of compassion and kindness and the language we speak to ourselves. We haven't been taught that as kids, right? How to talk to ourselves, how to help ourselves sort of, you know, come out of certain things when, when we do feel shame. It's like, it's okay, you're feeling shame now, but then let's, let's explore on how to come out of this. It's okay. So it's not necessarily like, I think it's Gabo Mate who says, like, you know, when people experience trauma, it's not the trauma that sort of, you know, affects them. It's the response to trauma, right? How does the person respond to it? And how does the society or the family or the people around them respond to it? And, and that how is, we remember it, right? And how we remember how it. We... If it is shameful, if you're thinking it's shameful or whatever, whatever, you're just going to just be in it and not allow yourself to come out of it. But if you said, yes, it happened and it's not my fault, but it's the other person and then try and give yourself that compassion and kindness and acceptance and know that it's just like, you know, meeting with an accident somewhere or, you know, you're able to overcome it a little differently with the acceptance of people. So it, it differs. There's a lot of, lot of, you know, healing that could take place from all of these things only if we could just sort of eliminate some of the effects of shame. Thanks, Ali. So the self bit is clear, I think, at least, you know, as clear as it can be within a short call. Uh, but what about the society or societal of the, our surrounding? Sure. How can that be? When it comes to society or even the topic of shame itself, it's completely constructed by the society to begin off with, right? So it develops in relation to the other. So we all have a responsibility to work together, to collaborate, to address some of these things. So, you know, we could we could promote awareness, which is pretty much what we're doing, like not necessarily with, you know, um, clear guides and toolboxes and, you know, a manual or no, this is how you've got to address it. Absolutely not. But at least a forum for us to have some healthy conversations around it. Educate ourselves check in with ourselves. And though I'm talking about this now, it doesn't mean I'm not going to feel shame or instill shame on others. I would continue to do that. But it's just that knowing, you know, when to stop and, and self-reflect and sort of challenge yourself a little bit as well, but also the society when things happens around you in, in a challenge stigma. Many of us don't. Many of us are, you know, silent participants. We don't actively engage, but we just watch. We, we, tell everyone to, you know, if there's bullying going on, what do we tell them? Oh, just ignore, right? Or if someone's being told off or, or you know, being called names, what do we say? Oh, do we really want to get into that mess? You know, the, those are barking dogs. Like, let them just say whatever and just let's let's carry on with whatever. So it's just the way that we address some of these things is very important. Encouraging open dialogue again, you know, encouraging people to come and tell their stories if they wanted to say. It doesn't necessarily need to be in public forum, but it could at least be with people they trust. It could be with a few friends, you know, where they could learn to be more vulnerable and be okay with being like Brene Brown. You know, I love her, but she talks a lot about vulnerability and that's the only sort of anecdote or antidote for um, shame because there's no other way it's embracing our vulnerabilities as well and saying you know we're not all there we're not all perfect it's okay right so again that culture what are we sort of putting out into the society when someone comes and tells you how do you behave you know what sort of language do you speak in your friend circles what sort of language do you speak with your children with your with your partners for example and sort of again fostering a lot of empathy and compassion kindness showing mm -hmm. kindness is also you know, something that we lack these days. It's a very unforgiving society these days, isn't it? You can't, everyone's just waiting and watching to see people, you know, make a mistake or fail. Or, and then they'll be like, oh, you did that, you know? So it's it's kind of being aware of some of these things and promoting, again, workplace inclusivity, diversity. I mean, those are all sort of there. It's not just not in South Asian community. I'm talking about, you know, in all communities for that matter, you know, 
always be aware of it. How inclusive is this for people? How inclusive am I in my sort of, you know, in my ways of working, in the way I promote my business, let's say, or my workplace? What, especially if you're in a service oriented uh, field, you know, how do you do that? And mental health support as well, especially for those who struggle, because there's a lot of shame and stigma attached to that as well. Right. And I think what the latest um, statistics is at 51%, and this is from Mind, I think it's 51% of people who have sought mental health support still struggle with shame around, you know, the labels, the the terms that we use for different difficulties, mental health difficulties, etc. So how can we then sort of address some of those things? Beauty standards, social media standards, you know, things like that. Can we address some of those? I mean, around the youngsters, for example, could we perhaps? Because it's it's everywhere. It's literally everywhere. And it's getting more and more um, how do you say it's it's out of control now? You know, you've got to be, you've got to look a certain way. If not, the young girls don't feel like they're pretty or worthy or, you know, of, of any sort of value. Um, men, boys, young boys are in the gym trying to bulk up, have these muscles. That's what that all about again. Why do you need to look a certain way to feel worthy and, you know, feel important? What's wrong with just you being you? And when I actually speak to you, because I work with the universities, so when I ask youngsters this, they don't know who they are. That's the sad part. They're like, we don't know, right? Because we don't we don't create a space for them to explore who they are by making mistakes. The only way you'll know that is by making mistakes. So if I was to ask you, for example, like what um, what's your favorite food in a menu? How would you know if you've never tried any of those things? You've got to try. You've got, it's a trial and error. It's a trial and error until you find, ah, oh, this is what I like and this is what I don't like, right? So, again, creating a, a, a society is, is absolutely necessary where people can talk about it. And I, I'm, you know, glad to say that you are one of them. And because doing this helps people build strength and resilience to be themselves. Again, you can't break shame any other way. It's being okay to be vulnerable is, is by us creating, you know, spaces to have safe discussions, creating that sort of ethos and value and attitude towards shame. 100% think we have had these conversations many times over that, you know, many people, whether it's family, friends, or people, well wishes out of love, out of, to protect or whatever. It's, you know, many people tell, even me, like, why do you have to tell that you had depression or why do you have to tell? Because, you know, we all feel depressed. We all feel sad. We all struggle. But it, it is, you know, it's not the norm to talk about it. And likewise, what you said about children, it's not only children. I feel, uh, you know, ashamed. Like when I put on weight, I have to lose the weight. And we were talking about wearing the glasses. Do we wear the glasses or do we wear the contacts? So there's so many myriad of reasons shame plays a uh, place up in your life yeah it does it does and it's so subtle again Menaka. and like I said it's not like of course we are, we're focusing on shame today so we're mentioning the word shame but on a daily life how often do you think we would talk about the actual emotion of shame we would say I'm angry I'm frustrated you know I'll be like oh I'm fed up or you know something I'm tired I'm this I'm that whatever whatever that we experience but we never say I feel shame. This makes me feel shame. We don't. We very rarely talk about it. So sure. shame to talk about shame. Yeah. That's a nice way to put it. So how can we address the relationship between shame and mental health, Arani? I think when it comes to mental health, it's about knowing that just like you go and and you know seek sort of um, advice and support from doctors for diabetes or cholesterol or something else, let's say asthma, arthritis is a big thing these days. Why are we feeling so ashamed to go talk to people about how they feel emotionally, mentally? Right. I think it it stems from how in the olden times, you know, people who had mental health difficulties were sort of like, you know, put away in asylums. They were chained down. You know, they were treated differently. They were ostracized. We don't lock away people with diabetes. If we did, we wouldn't talk about that either. But, you know, they used to. So because of that, 
I think, okay, that, that element of shame and stigma has always been around. And there is a lot of emphasis on being normal, right? There's no such thing as normal, but it's interesting, right? How we all want to be normal. So the only way to address it is to create awareness again. Let's talk about not being okay. Let's, let's you know, kind of um, normalize, just like how you would go to a GP for, you know, prescriptions, go for talking therapy, go to a psychiatrist if you need help. We would go to a gym instructor, we'll go to a nutritionist, you know, it's the physical thing, we'll go get, I don't know, cosmetic stuff, Botox and other bits, you know, we're happy to do those things. But when it comes to our brain, our mental health, there's a lot of stigma and shame attached to it. You know, people come in and they'll be like, oh, I don't know what to say here. I don't know what to, you know, do here. How does it work? So let's talk more about it. Let's let's focus a lot more on mental health and shame and encourage people to go seek therapy. And what you'll find is I find that more younger people are open to it these days, right? But I find the professionals find it harder. So say, for example, like, you know, loads of people have assumed just because you know I'm, I'm a therapist or a psychologist or whatever, that I'm all set for life. I've got no problems, right? I'm going to be all, but absolutely not. I go for my own therapy. I have moments where I have no idea what to do, right? So we don't have like manuals and solutions and you know, it doesn't mean that uh, we're all okay all the time. It's noticing when you need support. Who do you go to? And and being okay to go and get that support that you need. Thank you so much, Arne. I think it is such an important topic and I really hope uh, people picked up at least one thing from this talk uh, to be more considerate, more empathetic, and at least pause for a second before you say something or you act in a certain way towards someone. So I think it's such an important topic and thank you so much for that. If you have to tell five things for people to definitely take home, what would they be? I would just say, understand what shame is. The first thing is just to understand what it feels like for you. It's very subjective. Right. So we cannot just say, oh, this is how you're going to feel, but you feel it in your body. It's just not in your mind. Right. You may feel that sort of that. I don't know. That's sort of like, how do you say um, almost that small kind of being small kind of feeling. You feel palpitations. You feel like, oh, I can't I can't show my face anywhere. Everyone's looking at me. You almost feel naked. Right. So just understand what that feels like for you. Have conversations with yourself. Be, be like, what does it feel like for me? When was the last time? Let's all just take a moment just to reflect. When did I feel shame? I'm not talking about daily shame, like, you know, like, I don't know, getting told off at school or being punished in school or whatever, but actually feeling shame. We've all felt it at some point in time, right? How did that make us feel, right? How voiceless did we feel? How powerless did we feel, right? It's becoming aware of that sort of stuff. And then have conversations with people you trust, somebody that you can reach out to and say, this is how I felt, you know, just be okay to say it. Because when you say it, you're giving it power. You're not running away from it. You're not shunning yourself away from it. You're not denying it. You're not avoiding it, right? When you actually, if you can't talk to anybody, at least write about it. Journal, completely journal it, be truthful, have a space for you to be honest with yourself, right? And then be okay with being vulnerable. Be okay with those parts of you. Because the more we say it, the more focus that we bring these things to the surface, the more okay we will be, uh, you know, with it. And if you have friends, you know, especially youngsters and all of us do, check in with them. Create a, create a space within friends, families, partners, for your partners and your, your friends to come and say, I'm not okay. This is happening and I feel this. Understand, empathize. I think I probably said more than five, but there's there's plenty out there. <laughs> Thank you so much, Adi. I can see how passionate you are about this topic. But I think if I have to pick one, I think create that tribe. Have those 
four, five, three people who you can just go and say anything and not be worried what they're going to think, what they're going to say, how they're going to judge you. And I think that's such a blessing. Yeah. And again, Brené Brown says you don't need like full load of people, just the five you can count on your fingers is more than enough. Good but enough. have them, right? Just make sure you have. I know we have... Um, been meaning to get you on the show for a long at least for a couple of years now um uh, but at last it has happened what is your experience and you know what would you like to say about the show or like what we could do differently Lisa oh, I think I think this is a great platform and I think you're doing a brilliant job bringing all kinds of people from all walks of life from all sorts of experience to share and this is what we need like a space for us to you know be able to just share just take an hour you know once a month just for us to sit and go like oh what's happening because we are living in such a fast-paced life right we're just just going with emotion, rat race, having to pay bills, having to, you know, we're caught up in this, in this race of life, let's say. But this, this, this sort of forums gives us a lot of um, space and also connectivity because I can see so many faces here. And even though we don't know anyone, it's just, it's, it's good to know that people are interested in these topics. And, you know, I'm not alone in this, in this experience. There are others there. There are experts there. There are solutions there. Being okay to create that network as well. And I think you've done that brilliantly. So, you know, I'm just hoping with shame, we've just literally touched the surface. We haven't even scraped it, just literally walked over it. So I'm hoping we can just take this and sort of, you know, break it down more. There's loads more that we can actually do, you know, um, especially with this topic around people in psychosocial sort of interventions and things like that. So we'd love to do more of those, but continue doing, you know, what you do, which is brilliant. Thank you so much, Annie. You're definitely coming back uh, talking about this a bit more. Uh, I think it's uh, certain things. I think we should really focus on topics that other people are reluctant or don't want to talk about as well. So, And that was part of the reason this uh, talk show was yeah. born. So thank you so much uh, for that generous feedback. Following tradition, let me just announce the next um, topic. And please hold on. You are going to be able to ask the questions from the speaker in a few minutes. Next month, it will be in the month of June, we will be talking about in our episode 129 about cyber abuse. So what is cyber abuse? It encompasses a spectrum of harmful behaviors facilitated by technology such as cyber harassment, cyber stalking, cyber bullying, and digital abuse. It revolves around the exertion of power and control, instilling fear and intimidation through digital means. And I think it is definitely become a, a bigger problem recently. So I'm really, really looking forward to it. We are going to be having an excellent speaker. We are going to have Stephen Perrion, who is a KC, that is King's Council. Stephen Perrion is a distinguished King's Council in crime based in London, commands the legal arena with unparalleled pros. Renowned for prosecuting and defending high-profile cases in the United Kingdom, his courtroom winners has earned global acclaim. Stephen navigates complex legal landscapes with precision, specializing in violent crimes, economic offenses, anti-money laundering, international arbitration, and mediation. Stevens' influence in shaping the law transcends borders. Notably, he is the first English KC appointed to the High Court of Malaysia. He's a partner at Rosli Dallan and Saravanan Partnership, a blue chip law firm in Kuala Lumpur. Outside the courtroom, Stephen is a compassionate humanitarian actively engaged with various charitable organizations. So I cannot really wait to have Stephen on the platform talking about another topic I am passionate about. Now, over to Tara Nathan to give the vote of thanks. Thank you, Menaka. Hello, everybody. I am Tara Nathan, connecting from London. I would like to thank Facebook Live and YouTube audiences for listening to the Meet Menaka talk show. And also would like to take this opportunity to thank the speaker who gracefully talked on the topic of 
the invisible chains exploring the crippling effect of shame and also would like to thank you the audience for taking the time out to tune in to and participate too it gives me great honor to be presenting the vote of thanks today arani balasingam brings over 15 years of invaluable experience in counseling psychology and psychosocial interventions specializing in survivors of sexual gender based violence child abuse and war trauma her dedication to bain mental health women empowerment and trauma advocacy reflects her commitment to social justice and human rights thank you so much arani it was an amazing and excellent in quality input from you see you next month for another wonderful episode of meet manika celebrating you thank you thank you so much uh, tani for that again a huge thank you to you arani and a big thank you to people who are listening on facebook because we are going to come off live stream people on the zoom please hang on you will be able to ask the questions uh, to arani um, in a minute people who are listening to us on facebook we will see you next month same time in the same place on facebook or please join us on zoom to talk about cyber abuse in our 129th episode with steven period until then stay safe be happy and keep smiling